Good afternoon, Liberty North AP Psych. It is Thursday, April 16th. Um, looks like we have another stay at home order through May 15th. So, bummer. Today's been a bummer day. Um, hope you guys are doing well. Uh, again, just uh, remember, so since today's Thursday, Friday, there is no live stream. So Friday is just a, a work day or maybe even an off day for you to take. Um, so um, uh, take a break um, if you need to. And then based on the new depressing news, um, yeah, maybe just take a day off. Although I don't think the weather's going to be very good, but this weekend it'll be great. So hope you guys are doing well. Um, I'm getting lots of assignments turned in, so good job. Uh, remember, your Chapter 15 assignments are due by tomorrow, uh, midnight. Um, and good job, Zach. Getting there? Good. Quiz, vocab assignment, and your Chapter 15 lab. Okay? And then, uh, then the only thing for the next, and enjoy it. Okay? All right. So if you want to get out your learning targets for Chapter 18, to continue on, Yeah. Okay. So we did one through three on Tuesday. Five or four through six uh, yesterday, and today we're going to do seven, eight, and nine. Okay. And then I'll, that'll leave us again no live stream on Friday, and then on Monday we'll we'll catch the last three, and then our essential question. Okay. Um. And today uh, is actually basically all in the same area and it's pretty much just over group influences. So I actually could have grouped seven, eight, and nine all together. Um, but I wanted to kind of spread out at least number seven because they do include Milgram and Ash, which we have already talked about. Um, and then mainly the bulk part of this is vocab. So um, as you can look down here for eight and nine, there are a bunch of in vocab anyway, which you need for the chapter. So um, this starts on page 737 in our book. If you're using the online text, just look for group influences on behavior and mental processes, because that's that's basically the topic sentence, if you will, the essential question of these three learning targets. Um, so AP learning target is how does group, how do groups influence behavior and mental processes? Number eight is the different types of group, groups that we could have. And then number nine is, again, group behavior. How does it influence individual behavior? OK, so. Basically, the synopsis is we're going to learn about the different types of groups that we can interact with, but also and then how those groups impact behavior and mental processes. OK, so we start out with number seven. Um, again, they really begin with basically groups um, cause us to conform. OK, so group pressure, if you will, uh, can basically be a huge factor in us conforming. Again, if you go back to Ash's study, uh, there was a group of five versus one in the study so there were five minutes. all of them chose the wrong line and then there is you and you have to decide whether you're going to conform or stand apart and choose the correct line 70 percent of the time people conform to the five okay now ash said in the book um that there are several factors that in, in that will increase the likelihood that we'll conform and one is that the group is three or more okay so the group has to be a little bit larger okay um you know it, do we do we envy the group way um to do obedience with stanley milgram again milgram study was mainly individual so it was based on one teacher one learner um but they have been replications of that in groups so again uh, milgram's going to say again the same factors uh that increase the likelihood that we're going to um, obey are the same in groups you know if the group is prestigious um so again think about the nazi group um you know if they're prestigious they have Attractive uniforms, um, attractive qualities, you know, those type of groups we're going to probably be more likely to obey. Um, okay, if it has in group bias, which we'll talk about, in other words, the group is appealing. Um, you know, Milgram talked about that. that was, his study was done at Yale. The researchers uh, had qualifications that were assumed. You know, there are a bunch of factors there that increase the likelihood of obedience. And those factors can be applied in each one to individuals or to groups. Okay. All right, then a very word that you see common factor that you find is actually the reason uh, for those uh, poor decisions. Um, and I'm sure we'll have with the coronavirus, you know, especially 
backwards with hindsight bias. Um, you can see where group think is going to probably influence negatively some decisions that were made. And what group think is, is when there's the, this desire in any decision making process within a group, if the desire is to be unify harmony and not, not be, not to be, uh, not to view opposition. So if the goal in the group and the decision making process is harmony and unity, people making incredibly important decisions and, opposes them or nobody offers a, an, an alternative view. Everybody just really wants to get along and wants to be viewed as part of the team and be and have harmony, then you're going to make bad decisions. Um, and some of the most historical, huge decisions, even the Titanic sinking, were based on uh, one factor, uh, were based on groupthink. Um, a great example, if you've seen the movie World War Z, um, love that movie, but um, um, so you know, this virus has, and I'm not saying this is going to happen with coronavirus, but uh, so, you know, it's causing people to turn into zombies. Uh, it's affecting everybody in the world. But Israel is the only country in the world that actually looked like they were prepared for it. And at the time, we're dealing with it correctly. So the United States flies Brad Pitt over to Israel to try to figure out why, how did they know it was coming um, and how were they prepared? And it was groupthink. They were the only country that didn't allow groupthink into the decision-making process. And how did they do that? They always had on this 10-person team, they had one person, and they called him uh, the rule of 10. And his job was to directly oppose every decision that they made. And they all knew that that was his job. But that was his job is to act like everybody else was wrong and nobody else knew what they were talking about and to be the objective uh, opposite viewpoint, if you will. That's why Israel was ready and nobody else was. Um, so, yeah, and you go through the book. And again, when you read all these terms, the book has examples of them. So it's same with the online text. And the book actually quotes very a few. Uh, and they're all huge historical moments in which wrong decisions were made. And groupthink was, was a lot of time one of the factors in there um, that, you know, we just don't want to create riffles. Uh, we don't want to create tension. We don't want people to think we don't like them. You know, we're just going to kind of sit here and just as long as everybody's getting along and everybody's OK, then we'll just go with it. We're not going to say anything. OK, that's groupthink. All right. So important term and powerful term. And we see it even today, um, you know, even probably in if you guys are a part of groups and activities, organizations, if you're in leadership. You know, there's a lot of times decisions are made based on groupthink. You know, we just want to take the easiest decision. The decision that that lacks the or that creates the least amount of opposition, and that's what we're going to go with. Okay, all right. Okay, so that's groupthink. All right, number eight, nine. So types of groups, and then how groups can influence individual behavior. So not just groups can influence group behavior, but groups can influence individual behavior, and we'll talk about it all. So start down here. Bystand. What we know is that um, there are factors when we look at helping behavior. There are factors that increase the likelihood that we're going to get help and decrease it. OK. And one of them is um, how many people are available to get help. And you would think that that'd make it more likely that I would get help, but it doesn't. It makes me least likely, less likely to get help. As they found in Kitty, Kitty Genevieve's case, there were 38 witnesses that witnessed the attack on her. None of them helped. The biggest problem was that there was 38 and the other 38 could see each other and they knew OK, that they what was going on and they saw other people watching it. So what did everybody assume? Everybody assumed that somebody else had already called the police, which did not happen until the very end of the attack. Some 35 minutes later, because they all thought that's one of the first thing they said. Well, why didn't you call the police? Because I thought I just thought somebody else had already done it. OK, so, you know, think about it. If my car breaks down off 435, I am statistically less likely to get help. Because everybody, all the hundreds of cars that pass me, think somebody else has already called or somebody else will stop. If I break down on a rural road, I'm more likely to get help. Because if I'm the car passing you, I know that there's not going to be very many cars that come by here. So I have to take more accountability and the help. Okay. So the bystander effect actually is, is really not one thing. It's actually a set of rules that indicate that if you're in a situation where you need help, if these factors are there, you're not going to get it. And if these, so you got to try to change the situation if you want help. Again, we talked about the CPR. That's why now you point to somebody and you say, you go call 911. Earlier, you know, five years ago, it was just, you know, somebody call 911 and you start compressions. But, you, but then everybody, nobody moved and everybody just assumed somebody else is going to call 911. So it didn't get done. Okay. 
So that's the bystander effect. Social facilitation. This is called home court advantage right here. That's what that is. So social facilitation means that my, my individual performance or performance is enhanced um, when I do it in front of more people or a large crowd. So athletes, uh, you know, music, um, band, uh, and the performance, that's social facilitation. Okay. So if you get up for big performances, big games, and you, you really, your performance is improved by a large crowd, that's social facilitation. Okay. Now the opposite of that is social inhibition. Okay. Which basically means that, you know, I, I don't value, or I really don't want to do, it doesn't increase my performance individual or group when we do it in front of people. It actually creates more anxiety or stress um, because it creates more room for, uh, you know, hostility and so on and so forth. So this would kind of be like playing, playing at the, in the home field. And this would be like playing at the away field um, against a team that, you know, you just generally don't maybe a, um, a team, if you will. Okay. That's social inhibition. Okay. So and I think you guys know if you're part of an activity or a club, you know, you know, the people that really like, and, are, and have their abilities kind of increased by playing in front of a big crowd and people that they know. And then you have, I don't like people watching me. That's a famous thing that you hear. I don't like people watching me. And that would be social inhibition. Okay. Group polarization is very fascinating. And we see this all the time. Um, but it kind of defies common sense a little bit. So it's kind of uh, one of those terms. But we see it in politics in America uh, over and over. And actually with the stimulus checks, if you remember that, um, so the stimulus checks have gone out, but when that first was proposed by President Trump, if you notice, the Democrats and Republicans came together, and they had to they had to be released because they were they just got further apart together. They need to, you know, they're not finding common ground. Our first instance, instinct is let's bring them together, and we can kind of work our differences out. Sometimes that happens, but individually by themselves as a group and then come back together, which is exactly what you saw with the stimulus bill, except there were two blowout meetings that brought them together. Again, they had a common goal. We need to help the American economy, but they just blew up and they became pol polarized. And that happened twice. And then they just had to stay apart and fix it and then kind of come back together and present what they did. And then that's when we kind of make ground. And it's amazing how in politics, that's always the way it happens. It just always happens that way. It's such a toxic thing at first. Okay. So, you know, it's just like if you have two friends that are fighting, you know, sometimes it might be good to bring them together, but sometimes it's not, it's just going to polarize it and you need to work with each one individually, then bring them together. Okay. So that's group polarization. Uh, De-individuation is the, basically the idea, the concept that in a group, I lose my sense of self. I lose my kind of identity as an individual and I conform to the group. Okay. And that happens uh, quicker if the group is bigger, right? And slower if the group is smaller. Okay. But I kind of just blend in and, and find my identity in the group. Okay. So it's kind of like if somebody, you know, is really into a sport or an activity or band or orchestra or whatever. And then when they're there, they kind of lose their sense of self and they kind of just are such a part of a team and such into what they're doing that that, that becomes their identity. Okay. So de-individuation. Okay. Which would be a great example of how the group can influence individual behavior because it can kind of change your identity and you can kind of lose it for the sake of the group. Okay. Diffusion of responsibility, which kind of goes along also with it's, it's also a part of the bystander effect. Cause remember bystander effect refers to several things. Um, but diffusion of responsibility uh, is basically, and you guys have all experienced this, whether you've been in groups, working on a project or an assignment, or you're, you're in leadership of activities. The more people that I have, the bigger my groups, does it actually make people more lazy? And the answer is yes. I feel like there's just so many other people and somebody else is going to get it done. Okay. Which goes back to that CPR example. You know, if I say somebody call 911 and there's 100 people standing around, Everybody's just going to say, well, somebody else can do it. But if I point at one person, then I've diffused the responsibility and it's their job to do it. OK. Um, or I've kind of ignited the responsibility, if you will. So that's why, you know, in academics, they generally assign groups more than four, because if you do that, you start getting an additional responsibility. Four is kind of the cap there in which you can actually still make people accountable, assign tasks. Um, but, 
you know, you guys know this, um, the bigger the groups, sometimes that's awesome because it's, we've got a lot of members, but a lot of members does not equal better work at times or more efficiency um, because other people think, well, you know, there's six other people in my group, somebody will get it done, you know, and that's kind of diffusion of responsibility. Okay. Uh, and we'll talk about this as well, because this actually leads to prejudice, which we'll talk about. So basically in any situation, if there's an in-group and an out-group, basically we have prejudice. And that's what psychology defines, social science used as a key component of the definition of prejudice is if there actually is an in-group, a favorable group, and then there's an out-group. Okay. Now there can always be a favorable group, but not necessarily an out-group. Okay. Um, but in-group bias, of course, is that I favor the in-group. I am more biased towards the in-group, um, even without any information. Um, and I'm also negatively biased against the out-group. So I attribute negative things to the out-group. Okay. Um, so, you know, you can even, it doesn't necessarily have to be bad. Okay. But generally, if I have an in-group and definitely an out-group, then I have, then I have bias and, and, prejudice generally. Okay. So, um, you know, rivalries, you can kind of look at that. I mean, that's kind of a, kind of a thing there, you know, so if there's definitely in group stuff, but there can also be rivalries that are fine, that are healthy. Okay. But they can quickly turn to toxic, um, and really tough and really hard on communities, especially if there starts to develop the in and out group. Okay. All right. Social norms. We know you guys hopefully know those by now, but you know, it's just rules standards of society that obviously impact the individual and the group. Okay. So we have norms, standards that we're living towards based on our environment at Liberty North or environment in Liberty, Kansas city. Okay. Like right now, stay, stay at home order is a norm. Okay. It's a standard until May 15th. Um, okay. And reciprocity norms. Um, basically, it's just kind of what it is. Um, so we view it as in group behavior and individual behavior. We grew it normal. We view it normal that if I do something for you, it's just respect expected that you would reciprocate. OK. And eventually do something for me. I'll scratch your back. You scratch mine. OK. And it can happen in a group. OK. I'll take over the shift for you, but you need to take over shift for me in the future. Right. And then it can happen across groups as well. You know, we're going to do this for you guys, this team, and we would expect it in return. OK, um, so this is basically any behavior that is kind of given is expected to be returned. OK. All right. So um, now all of these are example theories that, that indicate identify different types of groups, but also show how groups can influence group behavior and individual behavior. OK, so again, that's kind of the whole summary of this little section. And again, if you're looking at it in the uh, online textbook, all you got to do is look for group, group influences, group behavior. But that's basically what we're saying. So, again, if we go back to Kurt Lewin's formula, behavior is the function of the individual and the situation. OK, and the situation there's a bunch of different groups. OK, so even at Liberty North, you have friend groups, you have activity groups, you have sports groups, you have class groups, um, you have lunch groups. Okay. So we have so many groups, uh, you have a, a work group, you know, I mean, that's just kind of your family's a group. So we have all kinds of groups that are promoted by society. Actually groups are a social norm. We're social animals. We function individually, relationally, but we also function in groups. So groups are a part of our lives, a part of our existence. And they're part of that situation at times that can influence. Okay, so again, uh, I'm going to persuade you, read your text, okay? Because there are examples. Not only does the book define all these, but it gives you examples of all these. And I think they're pretty good examples. Um, but again, a lot of them refer to World War II, the Holocaust, um, and back to that period in, in, in world history. Um, where we were kind of, you know, that huge critical event was occurring. Um, peak experience for everybody involved. Um, okay. Any of these that I need to repeat if I cut out? It doesn't look like this, this stream cut out. I know I cut out this morning, but do I need to go over any of the terms again? We think we're good. There's a lot of them. I know that. But I think I think we might have covered just about half your vocab. Oh, and I'll, I'll put a picture of that on. I need to do that. I'll take a picture of and stick it on the uh, 
assignment link for chapter 18. I haven't done that, but I'll do that as soon as we're done with this live stream. Okay, any questions? Any questions? Okay. All right. So again, don't forget, you need to get your lab done, which I think is four questions for chapter 18, your vocab, uh, your AP learning targets. We only have three more to go, which we'll do on Monday. And we'll cover the essential question. And then, um, yeah, don't forget your AP notebook stuff, which will turn in on May 4th. Okay. Um, I think that's about it. And then we'll move on to our last unit. So yeah, uh, nobody's, everybody's good here. Man, we had some great questions this morning. Um, on some of this stuff. Hope I gave you examples that kind of help explain it. Awkward silence. Okay, are we good? Okay. All right, so again, remember tomorrow, no streams on Friday. So tomorrow's a work day, day off, just it's, Tomorrow's not going to be that good of a weather day, so maybe save it. But, um, yeah, the weekend will be great, so enjoy that. I'll see you guys on Monday. We'll finish up Chapter 18, um, and then we'll get ready for um, the last unit, which is 16 and 17, which will be great. Psych disorders and treatments, okay?